Good afternoon, I'm Brent Hall, and welcome to today's show. Boy, are we going to have some fun this afternoon. Peace, love, and groovy, man. That's all I have to say this afternoon. We're going to meet the man whose story inspired the Hollywood feature film Taking Woodstock, that wonderful film by Ang Lee. His name is Elliot Tiber. Without Elliot Tiber, there would have been no Woodstock. We're going to be talking about how he managed to convince a narrow-minded town to allow thousands of hippies to celebrate peace. Peace, love, and skinny dipping. (laughs) The word is getting out that maybe we'll have a few more guests than we originally thought. The New York State Thruway has been backed up all the way from the George Washington Bridge. It's basically a parking lot. Police are planning the first ever emergency closing of the entire Thruway. What? You know what those hippies are going to do to our town? We're shutting this thing down! If there's rain, might get a little electrical. We don't want to fry too much of the audience. What should I do? Rally your troops. Do I have troops? Got your mom, don't you? She's a battalion. You need help. What kind of help? My God. It's starting. Go see this thing. See what the center of the universe looks like. It's beautiful. It's fate. Right there at the top of that hill. Gave them the brownies. <laughs> Folks, if you are just joining us this afternoon, do we have a special treat for you? You've all seen the movie by now, Taking Woodstock, the true story of Elliot Tiber. Well, Elliot started out as a nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn named Eliyahu Tichberg. I was wondering, can you tell us what it was like growing up in Brooklyn in the 50s and the 60s? 40s, too. <laughs> I'm <laughs> older than I look. How old are you, anyway? I'm 75 now. I was 34 when I did Woodstock. You teenagers wouldn't be dressed like hippies if not for me. Let's start off at the beginning. I and... was raised in Bensonhurst in Brooklyn, in a lower middle class to the poor neighborhood, and my my father was a roofer, mother was a shopkeeper, and a Jewish mama who spits matzahs. <laughs> she was a tough cookie, or a tough matzah. Anyway. Can I just stop you right there? Let's talk about that relationship with your mom. I grew up, went to art school, and uh, went to college, and I was an art teacher and an interior designer, and very successful what I was doing. Then, 58, I guess, my parents sold their business in the city and wanted to live in the country, and I, like a fool, wanted to help them out, so I went up there weekends and they bought an old broken down bungalow colony that was the Borscht Belt was the Jewish resort section because uh, most places didn't and restricted policies wouldn't let Jews in so they built their own resorts and it was quite thriving for about 40 years. When I came up there with them it was very cheap because most of the hotels were already closed it was, they invented something called the airplane and you could fly to Paris or Miami or wherever or Montreal or wherever it was cheaper than you could stay at these hotels so business was dead and that's why it was so cheap but I didn't pay mind I didn't know and my interest there was a big barn on the grounds and I wanted to make a theater I was I didn't really like interior design and I was always trying to write comedy and I wanted to be a humorist and I said hey, I'll have my own theater because I wouldn't audition and who likes rejection anyway and so uh, this was the situation and so for 10 years uh, and I was gay and uh, not out of the closet totally tough to find for tough in the 50s it wasn't even the word gay then, and uh, there were only a couple of bars in the village where I lived, and police always hassled us. And anyway, for 10 years, I in that place, we built a motel and a hotel, and it was always my money from the city putting in, dumping into there, and we didn't have much business, and I just kept dumping it in because my parents had nothing else. And being a dutiful son, for what reason, I don't know. They certainly didn't earn my respect or love. So um, for 10 years, we was doing this, and and I had the 33 actors in the theater in my barn, and uh, we were doing Shakespeare in the nude, and Beckett in the nude, and Tennessee Williams in the nude, and nobody came except me every year. That was my milkman, Max Yaska. He bought a ticket, and he gave eggs and cheese and milk to the actors. And I issued, I was president of the Chamber of Commerce, even though you need commerce to have a chamber, right? 
well, nobody else wanted it, so I was, and I issued myself a music festival permit every year for 10 years, and they held music festivals on the lawn, you know, records, and sometimes some high school kids would play something, but a few stragglers and drunks came by, but one person bought tickets, that was my milk, my match, Oscar. So then in the summer of 69, I went in the city one night in June, and there at the Stonewall Bar, I started what has come to be known as the Stonewall Revolution, overturning the police car from this gay bar, and the because the cops always came in and took payoffs and beat us up and hassled us and someone hollered in the back of the bar, gay power, who knew what that meant? It didn't mean anything then. So we overturned the police car, demanded that the mayor come and a thousand people around the bar in the street, it was the village, and even poet Alan Ginsburg lived up the street. He was there cheering us on. Then Judy Garland died, who was my icon for so many years. And then uh, Woodstock, so we up in the country, Woodstock was supposed to be having a festival in uh, in the town of Wallkill, 25 miles south, and there was full-page notice in the paper with a picture of one of their farmers with a shotgun aimed at the Woodstock bird on the poster, and it said, Wallkill cancels the permit because we don't want our town flooded with 10,000, that's what they thought tickets were sold, 10,000 hippies, drug addicts, homosexuals, and dirty dykes raping cows. <laughs> Why the dykes were dirty, I don't know, and I'm a vegetarian, so raping cows is beyond my sphere of knowledge. Capabilities. <laughs> you know, I, I laugh, but this was the thought pattern of folks back then. You know, you mentioned uh, you're a gay man, and you're absolutely right. People that were gay had to stay in the closet. We didn't even have that phrase then, either. No, that's right. That's right. Okay, I'll let you continue. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, well, you always have to interrupt me because I never, I never stop talking. No, that's uh, perfect because my audience is university students. It's broadcast. Oh, show. oh, terrific! Right across the university system here in Canada. You know the questions that I get asked all the time. I had Sam Cutler on. He was tour manager for the Rolling Stones. He was at Altamont. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was telling us that story and after that the flood of emails I got about Woodstock were you there what happened and I said no I'm not you know I wasn't allowed to go there's a fascination tour, go ahead I tour America universities and colleges I speak about Woodstock and other things just I haven't had a big book for Canada though I don't know why because student groups you know ask for me and so I go anyway so there I am with this and 33 actors and I called up Woodstock production and I said what do you want and I said well you don't have a permit I permit, and I have 15 acres of land to come do your festival here. So Mike Lang got on the phone, the producer, and he said, where are you? And I told him, he said, I don't see White Lake on the map. I said, well, I'm the Chamber of Commerce. Our maps have White Lake on it. Yours doesn't. So I'm, he said, can you make a cross with your white sheets? I said, I have a hotel on the lawn, and I'll be there in a helicopter in 15 minutes. I mean, they were desperate. They lost $2 million, and they have no permit. They were folding up their tents, literally. And so I went out on the lawn and made with the actors and we made a huge white cross and other Jewish religious icon on radio. Uh, the woman who spits matzahs comes running out and screaming and what is this took this clan on my Jewish lawn are you all crazy and the actors all stripped down to their birthday suits painted the lipstick on their bodies peace love and music and were doing some kind of voodoo dance around that helicopter and the helicopter came in they got out and then some limo showed up with lawyers and where's the permit where's the permit I showed them the permit and it literally had a kosher stamp on it because I got that from Max Jazzica's butcher part of his grocery because we couldn't afford stamps. And they said, it's coach of that stamp, that permit. And then I took them to the back of my grounds and we didn't have much money for plumbing. So we had a lot of cesspools and it was like a swamp. And they said, there's no way we could do it. We love you for trying, but we need dry grass, big open fields. I said, wait a minute, my milkman, he has hundreds of acres up the road with nothing but cows. They could move the damn cows. So we went to Max and he said, sure, $50 a day for three days, but you have to clean up afterwards. The Monaco Resort is my parents' lifeblood. Oh, it's a resort now? With the addition of the swimming pool, we should drive heavy tourist traffic right to our door. Dad, that's bleach for laundry. It kills the germs. What's the difference? I'm sorry. You're in arrears on the mortgage. Just give us a couple months. Please. We'll get the money. Look at this. Some hippie thing's gonna get canceled unless they find a new place for the concert. Wow, Janis Joplin. Grateful Dead, The Who. Well, the locals killed it. Bummer, man. Can you connect me with something called the Woodstock Ventures? Hey, man. You have a permit, right? Yeah. Very cool. 
say you want to use these fields here? That's why we're here. But you'll have to tidy up after yourself. Of course. We're going to need a place for people to crash. Why don't we just buy the Armada go out for the season? We like to pay cash in advance. Your mother says we can triple our money. Three times the rooms. And we didn't know what that would mean. And anyway, as it turned out, after and within hours, my place was flooded with thousands of people, volunteers, workers, and within a couple of days, maybe 10,000 people. The whole town only had 1,500 people, 500 Jewish resort owners, and 1,000 Nazis. That was our population. Let's talk about the Nazis for a second. Can you tell us about the anti-Semitism that was right inside the town? They weren't just against the concert, the festival, but they really brought in a lot of anti-Semitism against it as well. Well. well, there always was. On the side of my building, they always painted swastikas and faggot go home. My parents knew what a swastika was. They didn't know what faggot meant, but we painted it over all the time. And they stole the lawnmowers and broke windows over the years. That's how they were. There were a lot of Germans came after the war, and these were their children and grandchildren who grew up with the wonderful mentality. They worked as plumbers and electricians and all of that for the different cottage colonies and hotels. And so they resented the Jewish people. Uh, if not for the Jewish owners or Jewish developers there who came there and built it up, there would have been no business at all, except for Max's Paris and his milk. He had great milk and buttermilk and cheese. Anyway, so, and he was starving too. There was no business. So that was the anti-Semitism. And in the movie, they pulled thugs because they didn't want an X-rated movie, so they cleaned it up. My mother's not called a bitch. She's called eccentric. The place was really packed, and then they wanted the town board, the right-wingers, wanted payoffs, bribes. So we paid them 25 thousand each, ten of them. That was a lot of money in 1969. Yeah. It's like 250000 today, I guess. And we were going on a few weeks, and then the Tuesday before the Friday festival, the 10th, 11th, whatever that was, another one of their uh, hoods came by, and he wanted $100,000, or else he said he would have a Supreme Court judge violate the permit and would be all over. So I panicked. I said to Mike, and he was always saying, cool, man, everything's cool, through, be cool, and smiling all the time. I didn't know he was stoned. The radio and TVs all had rented space we had in the NBC Network Radio Nationwide. And I was never on the radio. I was not shy, but I never went on the radio. So what will I say? He said, just tell them what's happening. So I introduced myself and I said, if you want the three days of peace, love, and music, please don't wait till Friday. Come out now because the Nazis, they didn't have a three minute delay the way they do today because the Nazis are going to stop us. So please come out. And then I added in, I was so stunned too. I added in, oh, and if you don't have tip, not a problem. It's all free. It's all free music free concert club. Well, three in the morning, the following morning, the two little lane road we had was five lanes of one-way traffic with headlights shining, with school buses and Volkswagens and kids and horses and, I don't know, skates, turtles. It was everything there and sitting on tops of these cars and buses singing. And the Joni Mitchell song, the Woodstock song, and singing. Mm -hmm. They were on the way. There was not even a sign up anything, so I was an artist. I always painted signs. So I painted a fair sign, Woodstock, this is it. And there was a half million people overnight. And the following day, another half million clogged the highways. Governor Rockefeller got on TV and he's announced New York State Thruway is closed from New York City, 100 miles away, up to Canada because uh, it's now a parking lot. And my mother says, what did you do with your big mouth? And meanwhile, she was raking in the money because they rented every room we have. They hired me. They had a big fee as liaison. They hired all the actors. They rented every room and they rented shower curtains and we paid off our mortgage within 24 hours, and my father thought it was wonderful. He was kind of sickly and depressed all the time, and he was out there directing traffic with a flashlight. We only had one cop in town, and uh, within 24 hours, there were hundreds of state troopers ready to beat us all up, but they got so stoned from the fumes that they started to put flowers in their helmets. <laughs> Even the nuns got stoned. They were walking around. You couldn't drive anywhere. Just walking around, giving peace signs. I couldn't believe it. These uptight nuns. There's a Hasidic funeral. That's Jewish religious funeral. Mm -hmm, sure, they, yeah. And they had to walk, and uh, they were cursing me as they passed and spitting at me. I said, "Do you know what I think of rabbis? Go back to the yeshiva of Flappish, where I studied." <laughs> My mother wanted me to be a rabbi when I was 13. I said, look, you got three choices. I'll be a decorator, a hairdresser, or a ballet dancer from a metropolitan opera called the ballet. She said, the ballet uh -huh. dancer? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She didn't want well, you to I be a doctor? 
<laughs> yeah, a, a doctor, of course, a rabbi or a doctor. Folks, we're speaking with Elliot Deber today. You've all seen Ang Lee's movie by now, Taking Woodstock. This is the real-life story of a real-life guy that's responsible for Woodstock, bar none. Now, if you haven't heard of Woodstock, where you been? It took place in August 1969. Half a million people at a concert. And, and half a million on the highway. There you go. And not one recorded incident of violence at the concert. No, no killing, no fighting, nothing. Oh, by the way, it's based on my best-selling book, Taking Woodstock, which exactly. is on Amazon and bookstores everywhere, and it's in 13 languages. Why do you speak in, in Canada? French and English and what else? Um, Hebrew. No all. Nazis up there? Trust me, there's Nazis everywhere. Folks, by the way, easy way to get it is always www.brenthollandshow.com. Click on the book cover. We'll take you right to a spot online where you can order it. Get the book. It's a wonderful book, and it's a much more personal read. It's going to but take you. If you, you have re- college students listening, please, they can't read chapter three because that's probably the width of handcuffs. <laughs> now you know everybody's going to gravitate to chapter three. The word is getting out that maybe we'll have a few more guests than we originally thought. The New York State Thruway has been backed up all the way from the George Washington Bridge. It's basically a parking lot. Police are planning the first ever emergency closing of the entire Thruway. What? You know what those hippies are going to do to our town? We're setting this thing down! That this rain might get a little electrical. We don't want to fry too much of the audience. What should I do? Rally your troops. Do I have troops? Got your mom, don't you? She's a battalion. You need help. What kind of help? God. It's starting. Go see this thing. See what the center of the universe looks like. It's beautiful. It's fate. I'm right there at the top of that hill. You gave them the brownies? <laughs> How did you feel about Dimitri playing you? <clears throat> oh, boy. Um, we're not uh, at all alike. I don't understand that. I wasn't responsible for casting. I was a hired consultant for the movie. I gave my list. I wanted a young Zira Mostel or a young Gene Wilder. And they came up with a Catholic straight guy because it was the same age who had never acted in a movie. So um, uh, I think he's just uh, wonderful, wonderful. I would pay him twice to do it again. Are are you being facetious, or were you happy, really happy with his performance? I loved the movie, and what Ang Lee did was just brilliant, and the uh, rest of the cast was just a sheer genius, and he, uh, technically they did a beautiful job. All of those, uh, the hippies that looked like a half million, were 20,000 young people that were hired as extras and trained for five weeks upstate New York in a hippie camp. We have no muscle boys because who showed up to audition because there were no people going to gyms in those days. That's Right. And so they're out. But a lot of people with long hair came. Others, they grew the hair in the five weeks. And they thought them how to say groovy man, cool, you know, with some authenticity. But Vilma is a real character. The, uh, it's a combination of two people, actually. And Billy was a combination of two people who came back from Vietnam. But they were real. Ang Lee didn't decide to put them there. They were in the script. How did you feel about the Vietnam War? Now, I'm just trying to put the students in context here, Elliot. That's why it was only a year, a little over a year, before... Before that, Martin Luther King had died April 4th, 1968, and Bobby Kennedy, June 6th, 1968. How did that affect you, and do you think Woodstock was kind of... You know, many people put a lot of precedent on the Beatles coming over after the Kennedy assassination as kind of a release and and what society needed. Do you think Woodstock was kind of that in its own way? Well, there were a lot of anti-Vietnam War protesters up there, many, many. But there's a scene in the movie which was real and it happened of this man who's cleaning the porter toilets. A Mm -hmm. porter asked him, what do you think of all of this? stuff with Vietnam going on. He said, I have two sons. One is in Vietnam. He died in the mud. The other is here laying in the mud. I wish the other one was in this mud. Very powerful. Right. There were a lot of protests against it. Of course, we were against the war, and it was all a terrible mess, a horrible thing. This is even worse. We have now the three wars we have with the terrorism and all of that is just horrific. But that festival was a release for people, like Richie Havens and so on. Freedom, that when I heard that, it gave me a 
clue as to what it was about. It represented freedom for uh, me and a lot of people there. Freedom of expression and freedom to get naked and have sex, dance, and rock and roll right under the stars and in the lake. For the first time, there must have been about 100,000 gays and lesbians there out of a million people, if you go by the 10% thing you before. There was a lot of that going on. My parents saw me kissing this guy a few times in the bar. They said nothing, but that never happened to me before. It was just an amazing feeling that changed my whole life. That's why it's called taking Woodstock. I've been taking Woodstock with me for 40 years. Wow. Parts, you know. Do you think that was the first coming out party, if you will? The first gay pride parade, in a yes. sense? Yes. The, the, the Stonewall was the first step of that. The Flower Children, the summer before in San Francisco, was the mm -hmm. first step. Then Woodstock. And then uh, with the Stonewall, that led to us to have a gay pride parade. And that first parade, there was about a million people on Fifth Avenue straight and their uh, gays, mostly straight, watching it with their mouths it dropped open to see 400 common Mirandas then in town. But this past year, there was 4 million people here. It started up for all over the world. And there are Woodstock festivals, or they call them that, in Poland and South Africa. I get invited to be here and there. I'm afraid to fly much anymore. It has resonated around the world. Russia, Poland, South America. I'm a bestseller in Germany. Muzzle Amazing. Tough. In Germany, yeah. Muzzle tough. About 10 of their TV uh, reporters came here with their crews to film me all of that, and it was interesting. And I said, I don't understand. In the book, I talk about the Nazis and they're not just thugs in the movie they're called thugs but in the book called Nazis and most of them were in the early 30s I asked one of them how come so much interest from Germany the book is a bestseller the movie and blah blah and he says to me uh, listen I know what my grandparents did and a lot of us do and we're really ashamed we feel terrible and a lot of us were talking about it and this was one way we felt we could make it up not wow. make it up but you know um, mm -hmm compensate a bit. Compensate so that was very interesting to me to hear that. That's a profound change from the 60s. What else has changed since that time? Well, these people ask me, do you think there'll be another Woodstock? I don't. When you see a few weeks ago or months ago in Los Angeles mm -hmm. at the convention center, there was 180,000 people, a rave concert. What, 15 were killed and hundreds injured? They're going to raves, which is not a music concert. They're going high on crack and on cocaine. We did weed. It was very innocent compared to today. High on crack and cocaine and heroin and booze and they are looking for the hip hop and rap songs and lyrics are encouraging violence kill the police, kill the fairs whatever. Like in uh, Jamaica they do that, Cayman Islands where there's so much hate for gays. This is where they go so there are a lot of gays that go but it's a rave they're drunk and on drugs they're not love songs. We had love songs. Lyrics could understand. We were about peace and love and love making and music and that's not what they're doing today so I don't listen to that I still listen to Janis Joplin and Joe Cocker and ah Joe Cocker <laughs> did you see any of the acts on stage a lot of them stayed in my hotel I didn't get to the concert because I was four miles mm -hmm. down the road and I turned my 15 acres into a triage because kids were walking on broken glass bad acid trips and I got volunteer nurses and doctors to help out 15 to 20 thousand people in my grounds laying in hammocks in the trees there was no place to go it was pouring but I did hear the music there's a five mile lake there right Lake we were on, and it echoed right off of there, and I heard every lyric of every song, and the way I knew it finally started that Friday was Richie Haven started to sing Freedom. I didn't even know who he was, and that's how I knew the concert began. I did get to the farm, but I got trapped into a trailer with this guy and girl, and we did some acid, which I never did. In the movie, he did a beautiful job. It shows that you couldn't even see the stage. It was so far away from the hilltop, and the girl with Claire Dane, and she says, let's go into the ocean. There's a sea here. And then the cameras plan to show the stage. We don't see the stage. What we see are bright lights. We hear music, and the lights become shooting stars. And then all the people become, with computers, they did it, come those waves, like a sea of people waving back and forth. It was just so amazing. And that was really because they interviewed me and taped me my description of all this stuff so that they caught it. And that's what it looked like. Of course, being high on some acid helped. But that was the essence of Woodstock, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Center and of the universe. A lot universe. of lovemaking and no fighting. It was just, yeah. it was a universe of music and lovemaking. Kind of and a utopia. We finally achieved it for one brief moment. You mentioned that a lot of stars stayed at your place. Did you have any stories that you can tell us or anything like oh, that? Oh, I've been a Stroplin. I spent some time with her. She was stoned and drunk, and uh, we messed mm -hmm. around, and Jimi Hendrix, and. You messed around uh, with Janice? 
Yes. <laughs> okay. She was one of my idols. Well, in my book, I talk about, as a designer, I met a lot of people, became friends with them, Tennessee Williams, Truman mm-hmm. Capote, Rock Hudson, and Marlon Brando, Wally Cox, who was his lover, who was a big star on TV then in the series called Mr. Peepers, when Marlon wasn't even known. A year later, after I met him and got friendly, messed around <laughs> at parties, he became famous with Streetcar. So I met all these kind of people over the years, and there at the festival, um, most of the singers, well, half of them, let's say, stayed at my place. They came for showers. They had something to eat, to drink, and so I hung with them. Very cool. Nice folks for the most part? So, no, everybody was having a terrific time. There was a lot of problems because there was no food and no water, but they had for the uh, performers, they had drinks and water and helicopter service to get them to and from, so that was pretty good. But the rains, they had to even stop performing for many hours because of the electric wires and all that and the steel piping on the stages. Everybody would have electrocuted, so they had to wait for it to calm down. Oh, it was amazing how this, the heavens opened up, but everybody loved it. They're singing in the rain, 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 go away, all of that kind of thing. A real uh, community of communities. Yes, it was. And people were helping each other out with food and water and medicine and grass and, and uh, bowls of granola and whatever they could, you know, candy bars, whatever they could get together. And the army airlifted food and packages to everybody and bandages, all of that stuff. It was amazing. How did you meet Ang Lee? Oh, in August 07, when the hard book came out, hardcover came out, I went to San Francisco to go on a talk show, a TV talk show, and there he was the other guest we met in the green room, and I recognized who he was, so I told him how wonderful I thought he was and all of that stuff, and he asked me what I'm doing here. I said, did you ever hear Woodstock? He said, oh, yeah, I was a teenager in Taiwan with long hair, bell-bottom pants. The police <laughs> came door to door with, with a uh, van, and they either, either cut your hair in your jeans or you went to jail. And a lot of his friends went to jail, and he says, a little while later, Woodstock happened, and wow, we were all free. It was a whole new world. Why? So I told him who I was. I made I knew I had a two-minute time to pitch. That's what a pitch is. And so I pitched it, and then I said, by the way, and he gave me such a hug, and I thought, maybe he's gay. That would be nice. I would love geniuses. And then, um, but he's not. And uh, so I said, I happen to have a book in my tote bag for you. I said, I love your movies, but everybody dies in them. Why can't you do a comedy? So I'd love to if I found the right one. I said, well, you're laughing here for two minutes with me. That's what my book is about. Two months later, he calls. We had a movie deal. He said, I'll make it within the one year. We'll put aside everything else. We'll make it in time for the 40th anniversary. And they did. Lasting legacy of Woodstock? Self-esteem and that you could do something with your life. I had no money. Nothing came from a poor family. I worked and put myself in college. You have to figure out what you want in life, what kind of dream you have, and go for it. And not to worry about failing or that you don't have a chance or you don't have connections. That's what I learned there. And, and that's what I hope that uh, young college students will hear. I think that's perfect. You know, I usually ask every guest what they would say to young people right across the country. I think you just answered that question right there. My new book is coming out in Uh October. It's called Palm Trees in the Hudson. It's a true story of the mob, Judy Garland, and interior decorating. It's a prequel to Taking Woodstock. To Taking Woodstock. It's a funny, funny book. Oh, I'm really looking forward to it. Where are you living now, Elliot? Are you in New York City? Are you outside New York? I live in New York. I moved back to New York City. I was living in Bangkok and in Hollywood and in Rome and wherever my plays, I write plays and musicals and theater and uh, I have a new show opening in Rome and in Paris and in Berlin next year. So I go where they take me. It's nice when they they take you first class. Muzzle tough. I do hope you get up to Canada. I hope somebody that's listening right now, folks, if when you're listening right across the University Network here, get Elliot up to give a talk. That would be fascinating. You're going to learn a lot from this guy. Not only just about Woodstock and real life history, but what it is to be a gay man in the 60s, the 70s and coming out, the whole coming out process. I think that's Tell him I look just like Brad Pitt, would you please? <laughs> 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 Who would you like to play you in the next movie? Whoopi Goldberg, I think, could do a great job. <laughs> what? She could be Butch. Yeah, and, you know, you guys could pass for twins almost. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for Woodstock, my friend. And thank my you. pleasure. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it so much. All the very best to you always. Thank you. Good luck to you, too. Like isn't. Wasn't that a blast, folks? Elliot Tiber, Living History, the man who inspired the story, the Hollywood feature film by Ang Lee, Taking Woodstock. This show, folks, is available on a free syndication basis. It's to inspire students, allow them to do their research with the real folks that went through these tumultuous events in their own words. All those archives are there free for you to download. I am Brent Holland. Thank you all for listening. 
See you next time. 